Yeah. So let's just fucking continue what I, what I was saying. Basically, so we were talking about being in a polyamorous relationship. Yeah. And as I was watching some of your videos, and uh-huh. one of your most popular videos is this video, Love is Madness. Uh-huh. Yeah. Love is Madness. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like where your whole world collapses. Yeah into and and the way that you describe it like into the irises of someone yeah. else's universe 100%. right like ex- just tell explain like briefly what that video was about and i'll sure. explain to you sure. like how that applies to polyamory and how it makes it so fucking ruthless yeah absolutely to actually deal with yeah well that video was i think in response to the anthropologist helen fisher's ted talk about the sort of biochemistry of romantic love in which she described love as a kind of madness, that it operates in the brain by hijacking dopamine and how it's fundamentally no different than being addicted to cocaine. Um, And that it's uh, very much like a craving and a drive, this this, this fixation that we developed for, for another person. And I think one of the best descriptions, the word that she used is that a person attains special meaning so if there's a lineup of five beautiful girls that are all objectively equally attractive but you develop a romantic fixation with one of them it's literally like the others become blurred into the background Mm -hmm. and and the one that becomes that attains special meaning it's kind of like a reverse dolly shot moment and then you develop a tunnel vision and the highs of that are beautiful because the normal sort of um, fragmentation in our attention where we're not very present because we're thinking about a million different things, whether it's all the social media signals that are interrupting us or uh, thinking about the past and uh, comparing what's happening now with the past, like all these things um, disappear in the tunnel vision of romantic love. So the high and, is and awesome. And that presence though. Right, the person like becomes your fucking, everything. That presence, yeah. even if it's not even love, even if it's just an interested date, yeah. the presence that you're able to bring makes That's that right. date ecstatic. That's right. Because That's presence right. is where the ecstasy and the magic always fucking lies. 1,000%. And then with love, you just get to extend the presence 100%. where it's not only the date, 100%. it's every text and it's every thought. That's right. And That's you're right. present That's with right. that one person That's in right. that moment right. That's right. all the time. That's right. And so, and so the poetic rhapsody of that when the feeling is reciprocated, when it's mutual, is awesome. Um, Alan Harrington in his book, The Immortalist, describe this experience as one in which um he says your your lover acts as a stand-in in a staged managed resurrection where the pilgrim without faith can die and live again <laughs> you know so yeah. yeah and he says that when we're in because love you, you have no faith you have no meaning where's the meaning where's the presence person, what am i doing what, what is life about oh yeah. my god that's i'm in right. love that's right. i believe in love that's i believe right. in god yes. i believe in myself yeah. in yeah. this universe that's again right, right? That's right. like you, that's you, presence you, you enter a halo and, and another phrase that he used is you temporarily step off the people mover. So you become like (laughs) gods that exist outside of time. Again, back to the idea of presence. Presence is freedom from past and future. It's eternity now. So if if most of us are on this like people mover, um, carrying everyone else towards entropy and death, so it's a people mover leading to the great (laughs) abyss, then when you're in love, this poetic madness this dopamine hijacking, hyper-presence, flow state, right? Because flow follows focus. Mm -hmm. This tunnel vision, this ecstatic tunnel vision takes you off the people mover and you get to co-mingle with another outside of time. So that is the the madness of love. But in the video, I call it the madness, you know, love is madness and I like it Mm -hmm. because, and you can probably relate to this, you know, we are, artists and so we are romantics and so we we like the elation that comes with romantic infatuation and that has fueled all the pop songs that has fueled all the romance novels and all that the, provides all the great poems all the great art all the all the great stuff comes from the love or the pain in the absence That's of right. love and how and you also have another video talking about how those things are so intermingled because you know it's so good that you know it can't last 100%. that you know you're mourning at the same time you're yeah. enjoying it yeah. That's, because that's right. we are temporal beings oh yeah Be- the whole experience 
is is objectively finite but subjectively infinite so from the outside right because science describes this i think it was ursula le guin who said science describes accurately from the outside and poetry describes accurately from the inside so Helen Fisher, anthropologist, scientist, materialist. She's like, yes, it's a drive. It hijacks your dopamine receptors. It's a cocaine addiction. It's a type of madness. It's tunnel vision. And of course, when it's not working or when it's not reciprocated and when the other person doesn't want to be in the relationship with you, well, then that that can be a maddening experience because you're being rejected at the fundamental level of your character structure because now you're measuring your whole world by the reflection of this person, you know, by you, you being seen in their, in the reflection in their irises. And so if the minute it doesn't work or the minute it can't be sustained or the minute the other person is not in all the way or the minute that reality bleeds through and gets in the way, everything is going to fall to shit. But if you can sustain the illusion, then it's kind of amazing. Or, but I mean, that's one of the fundamental if conundrums. Ride, if you can ride the ride with a level of awareness and a purview that knows that it's still a ride, it's what the Toltecs called their controlled folly. Yeah, It's wow. like a fully engaging in that moment as if it's life or death. So you enjoy it fully with all yeah. of the passion, mm. but a thin red line of awareness remains that knows that this is ultimately temporal. <sighs> and like, so as I was going to say, all right, Love is madness. Yeah. You're in a polyamorous relationship. I'm in a polyamorous relationship. Yeah. So let's not let's not use the second person. Let's use the first person. Yeah. I. Yeah. So we go through and I have this long standing seven year relationship with Whitney, a deep love, a deep partnership. Well, she falls deeply in love with her new boyfriend this last year. Mm-hmm love is madness Mm -hmm. she is collapsing the world around her so that ricky is the center of her attention focus the fixation of her madness the thing that draws her to the present moment but we have this long-standing seven-year history in this investment but it doesn't matter yeah it does but it doesn't because Uh the madness and that drug of love is upon her so the invitation for me is do i have the grace Mm to allow Mm. this madness Mm. to exist Mm. and step back and celebrate and cheer from the sideline and say, enjoy this, enjoy this ride, sweetheart. Like, I'm so happy for you to do it. And every once in a while I could get there, but most of the time I'm kicking and screaming like, no, 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 why, why, why? Because it's fucking hard. But then as we've now kind of, it's been seven months or so, and as we've worked through it and figured it out, there is a little glimmer of hope of that possibility to say, okay, I see how this is. This new relationship will capture that obsessive attention. Yeah. And that's okay. And I can have the grace to step back and like lay out the rose petals for you guys to enjoy this ride for as long as this ride goes. And if that's the ride that's going to take you longer, then I step back even further. But if it's just that temporary ride, at least have the grace to do it. And fuck, man, that's a deep, deep challenge. And I think with polyamory, people talk about a lot of the things. Yes, jealousy. Yes, it's hard to have your Mm -hmm. lover sleep with somebody. Yes, Mm -hmm. it's hard. But no, no, no. The hard part is to know that in their mind and in their heart and in their presence, you're taking a back seat. Sure. When you've been in the front seat, it's like being demoted. It's like, you're the president yeah. of the company. Just kidding. You're the yeah. secretary yeah. now. Yeah. You know, like, you're the king. Just kidding. You're the fucking, you know. Tolerating that kind of anguish um, takes a tremendous amount of character. And, and <laughs> you, were, you were saying it. even before we started to record that, that you had become aware that you have a, a you are attracted to struggle. Yes. That you have a kind of, an, <laughs> sure. an, an addiction to struggle or, or some yeah. kind of some whether it's conscious or unconscious pull towards putting yourself in the most difficult circumstances of all because if you can overcome those circumstances then well then your character structure becomes even more powerful well that was so that was the ideology that's that's allowed me to continue my addiction it's i'm doing this for yeah you know a resistance creates adaptation it's that old stoic philosophy Uh that marcus aurelius Uh put yourself in the struggle you'll become stronger for the struggle but now I'm realizing that really the only way out of that trap, because you'll always just be seeking another struggle then, That's right. <sighs> is to say, I'm putting myself in the struggle for the sake of the struggle itself. Because I enjoy the pressure of this 
force mm. that's acting upon me, whether it's sadness or whether it's grief or whether it's love, yeah. I'm going to enjoy that because it's better than the numb monotony right. of normal life. Right. So let me bask yeah, in right. the fucking gut-wrenching, right. crawling on the ground, vomitous, jealous <laughs> sorrows of this thing. And let me enjoy it because I am. That's the only way to actually well, you're do You're a it. poet right yeah. you're the war you're the warrior poet and it actually it actually makes sense um intensity um fuels aliveness and i think it was joseph campbell who said something to the extent of we're not looking for happiness we're looking for the experience of being alive we're looking for feelings of aliveness and, fuck and you so feel it's, alive. it's even it's when it's height, bad you feel heightened alive. intensity 100 percent. And, and going back to to the ecstasy and the anguish of, of this notion of romantic love. And so we're talking about sort of the, the madness of infatuation, but the beautiful madness, the poetic madness, as long as you have an awareness of this madness, you are an awareness of the, of the mechanics underlying this tunnel vision. Um, and I think it goes beyond just the material mechanics of it. Like, oh, dopamine is being hijacked by novelty of another person. And of course, all your instincts kicking into gear because you're meant to reproduce with this person and so on <laughs> and so forth. But there's a psychoanalyst called Ernest Becker uh -huh. and, and you're probably familiar with The Denial of Death. Denial of Death was a Pulitzer Prize winning book that basically says that the fundamental neurosis of the human animal, that which drives everything we do, is ultimately stemming from our the unbearable awareness of our mortality. And it's not so much like another animal reacting instinctually to a threat and running away from it. It's this extended awareness. It's mm -hmm. everything's fine, we're safe in this house, but guess what, in 30 years we're gonna be 60, 70, and we'll be that much closer We're to the on grave. the people mover to annihilation. 100%, losing sleep over the mortal coil. And the only response to what is essentially a paralyzing existential despair has been these three fundamental drives. So he calls it the religious solution to the problem of death, the romantic solution to the problem of death, and the creative solution to the problem of death. So the religious illusion we're all familiar with, like build cathedrals, connect with a narrative that, that makes you part of something larger than yourself. Now, most religions have corrupted this fundamental drive, mm -hmm. but in essence, the, the desire to commune with the infinite, right, is a way of broadening your sense of self beyond the mortal limited self to like capital S. I am part of everything. I am infinite like the universe and so on and so forth. So that's one way to dissipate death anxiety. The except, second way, except it's a lot better to do five MEO than go to a cathedral. In my experience, if you really well, want to, if you really want to actually, but it comes find from the like same, capital S self. But it's the same. It it comes from the same place though no to doubt. find a different self interpretation. Yeah, and and then the second one he calls it the the romantic solution to the problem of death. So this is what inspires all the pop songs. She's like the wind. She's my salvation. She is the sun. Right, And so finding another, elevating them to a deity, and then consummating with that deity makes you divine as well, right? Because if you merge with the divine, well, you become absorbed by the divine. You become infected by the divine. You become divine mm -hmm. and therefore immortal. The problem is that that's a lot of pressure on another human being. Yeah. He says, no relationship can bear the burden of godhood. And so that elation of romantic love is kind of like an impossible level of pressure to try to sustain. And the and, other and, person and, won't wear it right because yeah, the other well, person would have to believe you. Right. And that would make that person a little bit psychopathic. That's right. To like believe the adulation that you're yeah. putting on them. They're gonna receive that and be like, I'm I, I'm not really the sun. Like, right, so like I, 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 I yeah. take shits That's and right. I like, you know, I get worried about stuff. We are and I'm gods stressed. with anuses. <laughs> yeah, that was one of your lines I fucking loved. But yeah, that's the that's the thing. We all see our own shit. Yeah. And we all know our own shadows yeah. and we all know yeah. our, yes, perhaps we're aware of our divinity if yeah. we've actually been able to taste that. And that's beautiful. We, we have yeah. awareness of it. We also know our, our really just animalistic, yeah. you know, kind of in the mud humanity. And the dark shadows of that expression as well. Like we're all aware of that within us. So if someone is deifying us, ooh, it's hard oh, to wear it's, that. It's, it's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of pressure. But it has also, I think, like fueled some of our greatest art and some of our greatest poetry. And sure. I think for me, as somebody who has fixation or a love affair with aesthetics, um, with literature, with poetry, um, I sort of, I give myself permission sometimes to 
experience the elation and the madness of romantic fixation and love even though i know there's a kind of insanity there <laughs> and that no relationship can bear the burden of godhood and that everybody yeah. has their shadows and that eventually our lovers will reveal their clay feet but i think in the past i've nonetheless hurled myself into that feeling because i assumed that again like loving the struggle the pain and the anguish and the ecstasy will add to my character will heighten my aliveness will give me an experience to respond to and to reflect on you know because the alternative has always been one that's more passive and accepting um but then you tend to feel less yeah fuck that right yeah like fuck that <laughs> right. you know like we're in this playground here like take the most extreme rides you know yeah. like learn but learn from them and i guess to me, it's just having that, just that little shred of awareness. Like yeah. how much, mm -hmm. how much can I engage? How deeply can I play? Yeah. Like, can I play the Super Bowl yeah. for the love of fucking football yeah. and enjoy that game, whether I win or lose, yeah. you know, yeah. like, can I be in the moment as if this is life yeah. or death, yeah. willing to lay myself, knowing that regardless we're going to be showering in three hours and yeah. I'm going to go back to my fancy home in a little while anyways, yeah. but yeah. but play it all out, mm -hmm. you know, and play love all out, play yeah. anything else yeah. with well, that, that kind of passion. Well, that's that's beautifully put. And, and when you talk about having that glimmer of awareness in the background, I think that protects you from the potentially suicidal despair of having your world capsize if and when the situation doesn't work out. Yeah. So it's like, love the madness but don't be attached to an outcome <laughs> right you know and and, right. and 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 an example of this um jordan peterson had has this video about the difference between the, the voluntary killing of the ego and the involuntary killing of the ego very different things right so mm -hmm. the voluntary killing of the ego might be this like willing submission to die into yourself to for for, for, for an experience of psychological death so that something new can be reborn and that can be the ritualized psilocybin ceremony or ayahuasca ceremony or something that you, that you sort of willingly come to terms that you're going to do and you're going to hurl yourself into the abyss, as McKenna said, and see if it's a feather bed. Um, and which is fine. Death practices can be very healing because they yeah. allow us to flush flush our old selves, you know, flush the madness, be reset, be rebooted. But but it's it's something that we're doing voluntarily and mindfully. The involuntary killing of the ego is when you experience, let's say, somebody that you trust completely, like a, like a brother or a wife or a girlfriend, but somebody who you're so sure of that you would never in your wildest dreams think to question the integrity of this person. And then for that person to betray you or stab you in the back in the way you never saw coming, right? That capsizes your entire world because, you know, one of the things that Jordan Peterson says is that the world is fundamentally uh, incomprehensible like at its at its sort of full totality like what, yeah. what quantum physics what string theory what like we have atoms that were cooked in the furnaces of stars and we have <laughs> consciousness and we are away from the cosmos to know itself and we're born and we dream and we can pinwheel and conceive of the infinite yet we're we die i mean it's like the world is fundamentally absurd and 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 and, and we can't fully understand it but we have to make assumptions about the world in order to function and if some of those assumptions play out then we start to feel a sense of like we're in control. Even if it's just an illusion, we, mm. we need fundamental assumptions. Like, okay, I don't go to sleep terrified because I pretty much assume I'm gonna wake up tomorrow. And when I wake up and I'm right. commuting to work, I'm not terrified because I'm assuming I'm gonna make it to work safely and do my thing. You know, like we make- I mean, I don't. I sacrifice a rabbit every night for the rising of the sun, but you know, either way- You have to tell me more about this, but- <laughs> No, I don't actually sacrifice okay, rabbits, okay, people. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but they did that in some cultures. They would fear, they would get an idea, infected with the idea that the sun wouldn't rise unless they did something dramatic. So they would have to ritually, yeah. you know, and I think we have our own versions of yeah, that sure. where this won't happen unless this or this. But I mean, superstitions that superstitions serve us. Yeah. That, yeah. That, it, that exist. But it's interesting to look anthropologically at what those superstitions yeah. were yeah. and well, how I, people I, get I paralyzed think, by think, falsity. Well, we can, yeah, the superstitions can become oppressive. Yeah. But 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 the use of them, at least at first, makes sense. Yep. It's to make certain assumptions about the world and be able to somewhat rely and on those assumptions. And have control, like that feeling of control. Yes, I can do this and the sun will rise. Right. It gives you purpose. That's right. It gives you meaning. That's right. It gives you this, 
I, me, can yes. create because the ego wants to be me. Yeah, ego yeah, wants yeah, to yeah, be God yeah, so yeah, bad. Yeah, of course. It's like me, I yeah. can control the rising of the sun if I just sacrifice this goat every that's day, right. you know? That's like right. That's right. that is a really attractive thing for oh, the ego for to sure. have. And so it, it's a slippery slope where we can yeah. give that ego, ego that power position. We need to feel like we have position. agency. That's oh, yeah. fundamentally it. But then, so, so then what Peterson says is, so that again, so the voluntary killing of the ego, but the involuntary killing of the ego would be when somebody that you trust betrays you in a horrendously fundamental way that you just never saw coming. So what happens is if you thought you knew this person and then your entire assumption about who they were is called into question, right? Because you, I mean, it's like you've known them for 10 years that you can put your life on the line for this person and then they fundamentally betray you, right? And then, yourself through their eyes. well, 100%, 100%. And so if your assumptions about this person that you thought you knew are called into question, then all your other assumptions about the world are potentially called into question. Mm. And so then you're actually hurled into a world of chaos because now none of your assumptions about reality- you Don't trust anything. That's right. And so then you're now, now you're in dark waters because, well- hell am i on the right path do i like my job where am i going i mean it's like it's like everything is called into question and that's the beginning of a personal crisis when the story you tell yourself about yourself is no longer convincing and so that's when the danger of a romantic fixation can play out because if in the madness of love you so to speak put all your character structure eggs in one basket and you are relying upon the feedback of one human being, that tunnel vision, to reflect you back to yourself, right? I know that I, ex I am not who I think I am. I am not who you think I am. I am who I think you think I am. It's the looking glass self theory mm -hmm. that Cooley put out. And you've normally, we distribute the self among friends, acquaintances, lovers, family, sense work, work, social media. Diversification of self-worth. A hundred percent. Not just self-worth, <laughs> self. Yes, yeah, exactly. Right? The, so the way we mirror ourselves based on how we're, the world looks at us, right? Yeah. Which we automatically do. We're social beings. You put somebody in isolation long enough, they go insane. <laughs> yeah. But then when, when the madness of love, if it's become just one person and then that one person betrays you, then not only does your whole sense of self get called into question because you thought you knew this person, but then talk about every other assumption about the world that you weren't even paying attention to because you were so focused on the person, all of that. So you have, you have effectively been capsized. And I think that's what happens to some people when they go like nutbag, you know, like some people, when they break up with their girlfriend, they end up going and doing some insane thing. Like they kill themselves or they do some crazy yeah. thing. So it's, it's understanding that, well, look, we're all on a spectrum and we're all affected differently, but like, but like, the, you know, that, that for all the dizzying elation of putting a person on this pedestal and falling into the, the poetic rhapsody of that kind of love, that if you don't have some kind of strong foundation or tethering, other alternative tetherings that keep you sane and or stable, you know, you can be... You have to, and that's what this open, yeah. that's what this open poly experiment teaches. You fundamentally have to know who you are without yeah. using the mirrors placed upon your lovers, because those will be turned to a different color and a different direction all the time. Like becoming aware of how deeply I was looking at myself yeah. between Whitney's legs and through her heart. The first one was between her legs, right? Sure, like sure. her sexual desire for me validated me as a man who was sexually viable and someone who I could be proud of and that I sure. could love because I was pounding my chest sure. like King Kong and I pleased between her legs and sure. that's what made me who I was and worthy of love as a man, as a sexual being, Full right? On. Well, then she starts having incredible sexual encounters with other people and i'm like fuck that mirror is no longer reflecting the same thing i'm not the only one i'm not the sexual god in her eyes mm -hmm. i'm just one of the monkeys that is able to do the thing that she sure. really enjoys sure. there sure. and so it recalibrates that and you, say, you have to say okay no i can not only diversify this but i can understand that i'm more than that and that i don't need that to love myself and then that was the first one, but then it came to the heart. And then like, oh, well, her love for me as the one, her deification of me as the one she wants to be with the most and the obsession of her minds and her fantasies through her heart, the one that will always be the most special and the most yeah. important to her, that's not there right now either. <laughs> and so 
where do I get that? I have to get that from myself, like a deep knowing of who I am from a spiritual, psychological, philosophical, biological foundation of like, okay, I am here, I am here, I am here. My presence, my awareness, I can still taste the food, I can still sit outside and dissolve my thinking mind into that universal awareness for just a moment and feel the I Mm. that transcends, again, going back to that spiritual solution to death, Mm -hmm. become the I that is the universal consciousness and that it's been a practice of teaching me that. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that, I mean, how, how, what do you think drove you to go through with this experience i mean were there parts of you that were like like because you know, the ego can kick into high gear and self-preservation mode and be like you know okay so she doesn't want to be with just me then fine let her go be with whoever she wants but i'm gonna go find somebody that does want to be with just me you oh know, i've like, had those moments okay i've had those moments yeah, many yeah. of those moments. Yeah, oh yeah. you like him yeah well fucking i'm getting on raya the dating app right and it's on right oh, it's right. on right. now Full you on. got someone you're in love with oh, yeah. i'm gonna find and someone of course all your friends and peers that care about your well-being you know yeah. they'll be like hey bro like you don't need you don't need this <laughs> bro, person like course. there's a thousand girls out of there that are gonna love you like remember who you are so yeah. my one my one of my closest friends used to always tell me like when I was distraught or in despair because I felt the significant person in my life was pulling away in some fundamental way and I was feeling my sense of self drown in self doubt or self loathing is my friend would be like remember who you are now <laughs> it's not so much that he was saying like remember you are an infinite being connected to the universe he was like Tom. he's like remember who you are you're Jason Silva you know <laughs> yeah, you yeah, have yeah. a global audience that watches your videos and you have that yeah. <laughs> it's like feed my Ego, feed my ego, feed my ego. <laughs> Please, tell me it's special. Breath. Yeah, but um, you know, I yeah, I, uh, I think so. so I, I have one thing that I turn to that has been to me, and I've said this before, and maybe this is shallow and self indulgent, but that has been more reliable than other people, and that's my art. Uh-huh. I can always turn to my art, and I think that that has given me a, a, a foundation because I've had immense amounts of heartbreak in my life and disappointment in romantic love. And, and, and I had the awareness. I went into everything aware of the existential bummer. And the fundamental existential bummer, again, is that nothing lasts. It's not just that uh, this relationship, this feeling won't stay exactly the same, but that we'll have ebbs and flows and our shadows will, will emerge and all these things. But just, all, just also the fact that like every minute is a minute we'll never get back and every moment is passing. And you know, like mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's it's something that has always fucked with me, but as long as I feel like I can, whatever I'm feeling, that I can take that and like turn to my turn to my work, turn to my videos, turn to my poetry, whatever it is that I can turn to and I guess concretize, like take this take this fleeting ephemeral anguish and turn it into like a fixed thing that then can exist in the world, right? Like my my name carved on the tree, my video. I find some kind of peace from that. And it doesn't mean that the moment won't pass. The moment will totally pass, but that work, I can press play on that work yeah. every time and that work doesn't well, that's change. The, that's the alchemy. That's the way that you alchemize the pain of anything yeah. into something that's valuable. Yeah. You can basically take all of this suffering yeah. and you compress it like yeah. coal yeah. into a little diamond. That's and that right. little diamond doesn't is something change. that you can share and that little diamond will shine for somebody else. That's right. Maybe in their dark times or maybe in yeah. another time. So no matter what you're going through, I do have the same process. That's the thing. But actually, probably... The most helpful part is when I'm able to do my art in a way where I feel like I've stepped out of the way and ascended to that oh, universal yeah, that universal place of like, this isn't even really me doing this. Yeah. Like, I don't know what I just said. I just gave a 30-minute talk, and I have no idea. And, and Those thank, are the and, best moments. And thank you, thank you. You know, you, you shake the hands, you go. And after one of those, I just sit down somewhere quiet, and I start weeping. Beautiful. Because it's like, that wasn't me. You know that line by Alan de Botton, we don't cry because something is sad, or we cry because something is more beautiful than we expected it to be. Oh, mm. that's it, mm-hmm, man. Mm-hmm. And then those moments, like I, I have fucking chill bumps right now. Beautiful. Like those are the moments where the art, and I, and I get to find that perspective. And that's, I think, what I'm fundamentally craving. I think if you look yeah. at the history of Aubrey Marcus, it's someone who's putting himself into struggle, more warrior and poet and all of these things. But now I'm craving that 
the hollow bone, the, em- the, the empty awareness. Mm. You're still engaging, still playing, still mm. engaging with life. I'm not going to a fucking monastery or something or trying to mm. absolve myself of mm-hmm. the polarity, but but finding those moments more often where mm. I can get my mind out of the way because it's oh, yeah. such a tyrant. Oh, yeah. My yeah. mind is such a fucking such tyrant. A, same, same. <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's, you're so right, dude. And, and I, I can't help but, but want to bring up again denial of death uh, because I feel like Ernest Becker really understood the human condition. He says that the fundamental difference between the neurotic and the creative is that the neurotic is precisely the one who cannot create. He cannot marshal a response. Both the artist and the neurotic are really sensitive. They both are overwhelmed by the world. They both take in the world, right, and are wrestling with the world. But the artist takes that in and reworks it into an active work project. Mm -hmm. So there is a kind of a feedback loop and a circularity. The artist can marshal a response, right? You know, so it's like there's a there's a response that says, I am here, I felt this, and this matters. And it is in the ability to respond, right, that you experience a kind of exorcism that frees you from your demons. The neurotic cannot do that. And so he chokes on his introversions. And so when you think of the pathologies of depression and anxiety, those diseases are characterized by excessive rumination which again, the introversions of a neurotic who is choking on his own neurosis. Jamie Wheel calls them the cul de sacs and error messages of a brain that has become too ordered. Michael Pollan in his book, How to Change Your Mind, about how psychedelics shake the snow globe, builds on Robin Carthart's Harris theory of the entropic brain that says that the diseases of an overactive ego of an overactive default mode network, of a brain, of an ego that has become a terrible tyrant, again, are characterized by this excessive rumination of obsessive mental habits and patterns of thinking that are like on loop, you know? And and, and the only way to dissipate that, right? The, the, the neurotic choking on his introversions is to find a way of experiencing a kind of metaphorical exorcism, so to speak. Yeah. And I think that the the artist has found a way to do it, right? Yeah. Through, through, his, through contending with the chaos, right? As, as Jordan Peterson would say, and then responding and creating order out of chaos, you shake the snow globe. And, and that's what psychedelics also do. They dissolve the patterns in our thinking, they shake the snow globe. And so there's something really healing that happens there. And, and, and so, I think we have to just think of the human condition as as being, it's it's very similar to what happens uh, or why we need to sleep, right? So during the day, we build all these toxins in our brain. And then at night, when we sleep, when we die, um, our brain flushes the toilet, cleans out the toxins. And I think that psychologically, the creative process is very similar. We take in all the shit we've picked up during the day, all the anguish, all the ecstasy, all the sadness, all the frustration, all the doubt. And we, we, respond in some concrete way and i think one of the important things for those people who are feeling that there might be a bar that you've set on being an artist you might think an artist has to be someone who can paint something beautiful or sing a song like one of the grammy winning voice you know performers or or move like one of the great dancers in the world or do something that's so prolific that the whole world will get a standing ovation from your art Bullshit. bullshit truth yeah Your truth is art, always. It doesn't fucking matter if it's a scream, if it's a cry, if it's authentic, if it's a splatter of paint, if it's you just moving and yelling. That's one of the reasons why I like ecstatic dance so much. That's that's a creative act. Because it's a creative act. You're moving and flowing and yelling and emoting, and it's always beautiful. It's always always art. So that bar that we've set on being an artist- we're all artists yeah. and like all of us can use that same process yeah. and remember that like it's not the external applause no. that makes the art the no. art even no. for the artists themselves like the best art you're like i wasn't even fucking there like i don't know i'm glad you guys like it yeah. Yeah. you know but so perhaps a better word than than turning to our art is just turning to our outlet yeah our creative outlet something that allows us to shake our which snow will, globe where which we can will be wrestle your with everything that's happening yeah. in a kind of in a container that allows us to 
I guess, exercise our demons, right? Coming back to this idea. Because that holding it in, yeah. that holding it all in, holding it all in, boxing it all in, more armor, more plates, more you become things. become a prisoner of your mind, which is what Fuck. depression and anxiety are. Fuck. Yeah. You know, like you have to find ways to dissipate that. And, and yes, the psychedelic experience, it yeah. doesn't just, sometimes it'll open a crack in the walls mm-hmm. and you'll peer through like a, maybe a gram of mushrooms in nature. You'll sure. kind of peer through and you'll look at it. And sometimes it'll be a 5-MEO experience that just dissolves all the walls. And you're like, ah, oh, walls are gone. What the fuck? And that can be really disruptive. I'm not recommending that for everybody. Because if you've spent a lifetime building walls and then all of them dissolve, how the fuck are you going to? integrate that maybe peek through first maybe peek through with a little you know dance or a little flotation or a little meditation or just find ways to soften these mortar you know yeah, yeah. walls that well, it's, you've like, created. it's like uh, rick doblin from maps i i i have asked him many times i'm like what made you you know push for mdma to be the uh, the modality of healing rather than psilocybin or lsd and and granted other researchers have said LSD has too much baggage, you know, it's associated with the 60s counterculture and we don't want to have that affect the research, you know, or the permission to do the research. Psilocybin is great because not a lot of people know about it, so we could technically do the research, but it still carries some of the psychological concerns of the classic psychedelics, which means that, yeah, they could heal trauma, but they could also cause trauma if if you're not in the right mind. Whereas, uh, Whereas MDMA, you know, back to like, peering through doesn't necessarily smash your lenses just kind of cleans them mm. you know and it does so in a holding the windows in a holding heart. loving yeah. embrace you know and so i was like oh that's cool so it's kind of foolproof in that sense you can't really have a bad trip on mdma so it's a good it's a good entry point it's the best to, and, so, and yeah. one of the i mean i've been involved in countless psychedelic journeys yeah. i've never seen healing at the level that I've seen in the MAPS protocol guided MDMA sessions. I've been fortunate enough to be in the room. And yes, it's not quite legal yet, but it's still happening with top level psychiatrists who are offering this on the underground, which in nine months, I mean, whenever this podcast released, might be seven months, Compassionate Care is gonna allow these centers to actually start broadening from the clinical trial model to like Compassionate Care. It's already coming on board, but I've seen it. I've seen, I've been there. I've participated myself. And watch people who've had every other type of therapy and treatment and EMDR and all of the things and just watch their heart walls melt Mm -hmm. and watch them go from, how could you do this to me when I was a kid to, I see why you did this. You had some stuff happen to you. It's okay. I forgive you. I love you. Oh, my God. I love my wife. Oh, my God. I love my life. Oh, my God. I love myself. Yeah, totally. And watch that happen in three or four hours. You're like, holy shit. We're on the precipice of a whole new paradigm of how to heal. And that's fucking exciting, man. Oh, it is the most exciting research, I think, happening right now. I mean, it does feel like a revolution in mental health because, you know, as we were talking about anxiety and depression and the diseases of excessive rumination, you know, Mm -hmm. um, that, that for the first time now we have modalities that in two or three sessions can cure people of anxiety, depression, PTSD. And we say Even cure, people who weren't responding yeah. to traditional medication. And we say cure, and usually that's a word you're like, yeah, cure. No, 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 no. That's what the research is showing. That's right. Three sessions, it's a cure. Mm-hmm. A cure. Yeah. Whoa. Not a treatment, not a pill for the rest of your life that numbs everything, makes everything a six. Yeah. You know, and just makes it... Cope yeah. makes you allows you yeah. to cope with it, yeah. Yeah. but actually, like cures. Some yeah, of these and, and, and it, it seems to work actually through very similar, in very similar ways to what we were talking about earlier about the healing power of the present. Um, and again, it, I guess it, it also it, it makes sense if if we could just love the present without getting attached to it. The suffering begins the minute we get attached to what's happening because what's happening is in motion, right? It's in mm. flux. The present keeps shifting. Oh, we want stasis so bad. We want everything to be the same, yeah. just like this forever. When it's good. Good luck. Yeah, yeah, good luck. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Not gonna happen. But yeah, but if, we, if, if I guess if there was a way of, you know, people like, for example, surfers um, or people that, that find their flow and build their lives around flow, report the highest levels of life satisfaction of any other group of people. Stephen Kotler has Mm -hmm. cited this research. And why is that? It's not because the surfer 
is so high on yesterday's wave and he's so in love with the wave he caught yesterday at 4.15. Oh my God, the sun was setting. The, it was the fucking greatest wave of my life. And he's suffering the rest of his life because he misses the wave that he, the wave he had yesterday. No, but he does know that waves, they come in, in waves, waves come in waves and he just builds his life around these natural rhythms of nature and he makes it so that as often as possible, his present gives him access to those beautiful waves. So I guess for me, the solution is not, what would be to, to curate my life. If we could like curate our lives and build our, our lives around access points to the present and to window dress the present so that it's as engaging and remarkable, as beautiful as possible, that feels like the closest thing to a solution. Mm -hmm. um, to agree. the human conundrum, you know? Be here now, so to speak, but, but exercise agency over your now as often as possible to make it as interesting as possible yep. so that you can get flooded by sense impressions but then drain your your pool of sense impressions just as quickly so that you can move on to the next set of sense impressions yeah and never stay attached yeah. and always keep moving that feels like so so the invitation then for all of us is what are those practices and there's so many different ways that you can find those practices it might be those five, five minutes of shavasana after you've been breathing and mm. moving and stretching and sweating in yoga and you sit lay down there in corpse pose and everything becomes still and you yeah. feel that sense of awareness tickling yeah. from your toes to your fingers to the top of your head that's always why they say at the end of the shavasana after a really good yoga class they're like okay wiggle your fingers and i'm like no 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 not yet yeah. No, 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 please, no, yeah. not yet. I don't want to turn over to my side. Yeah. I don't want to end this. Fucking let me sit here. I know you got another class, yeah. but I want to sit here for a little while because here now is where I am and it's ecstasy. Yeah. You know, so whatever that thing is, yeah. find that. Yeah. But somehow the ego doesn't, it has a bit of resistance. Mm -hmm. like, for me, I have a lot of these tools, but I'll, I'll go days or I'll maybe even go weeks where I'll just like, nah, I don't want to do yoga. Nah, I don't want to, I don't want to do this thing. I want to fucking sit in this shit of my mind because it's almost like the ego is an entity that wants to be actualized and yeah. realized by your belief in it, by this being trapped in it mm. so it resists these moments of release because it's like a death of that entity of our minds you know apparitions of our minds phantoms that we create and they want to survive but mm. we got to let them go we got to send them back to the light the light of awareness and presence mm. and that's that's the challenge well that yeah because because trauma comes from clinging and and healing comes from letting go <laughs> and uh and do you ever read david lenson's book on drugs no so he had a very interesting description of trauma or, or even, um, even anxiety. He said, anxiety is basically temporal dislocation. Just such a great phrase, right? So let's say you had a traumatic experience in the past or something really scary and unexpected that violated your expectations, that stabbed you in the back when you weren't looking, when you were innocent a long time ago happened to you. So the past trauma, the past is now over-determining the present. Mm -hmm. So you don't, you don't see the world as it is, you see the world as you are. And your cells are a technology that turns experience into biology. So that past trauma, you bring to the doorstep of every moment. So the past now over-determines the present. Because you're doing this subconsciously all the time. You walk into a room, you're assessing it for threats, whether you're aware of it or not. You know, and if you see somebody with a gun, you're going to run. Like, you know, we're always on the lookout for potential threats. But when you've had past trauma, when you've really experienced the threat, you're hypervigilant and on guard a thousand times more than the average person. Your cortisol is spiking. And so you're in this hyper anxious panic state. So your, your past trauma is overdetermining the present. You're walking into a present situation that's perfectly safe, but you're bringing into it, you're coloring it with that past trauma. And not only that, but then you're conjuring up a future that becomes identified with death and doom. And that's essentially what a panic attack is. When people have a panic attack in a, in a low stress situation, it's because the low stress situation is triggering the past trauma and the past trauma is over determining what's happening now and then conjuring up a future that becomes, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm gonna die. Like that, that fear that people have. And I, I thought that was a very powerful thing because he ultimately says that eventually, right, if you breathe and you let it pass, the present will supersede the past as it always does. 
the present is real. Right. <laughs> right. And yeah. so it's like you start to feel that panic. If you just allow the present to eventually supersede that past experience that you're bringing into the present, you actually realize that you're fine. And then you can learn from that. And I think people who are really traumatized, their amygdala is so overactive that they are bringing that past trauma everywhere they go. And one of the things that MDMA is known to do is to put people in an optimal arousal zone for psychotherapy and cognitive repatterning. And it does this by dampening activity in the amygdala, boosting activity in the frontal cortex, stimulating you while making you feel relaxed. And that Goldilocks zone is a great space from which to like revisit the past trauma mm -hmm. without triggering all the anxiety response going over the trauma, like visiting it, coming to terms with it, accepting it, and then ultimately relegating it to memory. Yeah. Because it's and, and still in the present, but once you make it a pat, you're like, oh, okay, that was horrible, but it happened to me in the past. And the beauty of MDMA- You've healed. The beauty of MDMA is when you're repatterning, it's like rewriting software. Imagine a floppy disk and you're rewriting it. Mm -hmm. But the beauty of MDMA is you're flooded with such positive feelings of love and safety and security that you're actually overwriting the revisiting of that experience with radically positive emotions. That's right. Because of where you are now. Because of where you are That's now. That. So you're rewriting the memory with the feelings that you're holding presently, which are so immensely positive, which is why it has that double- value brilliant right Be, and and when i talk to the some of the psychiatrists like you know michael and annie midhofer and some of the people who are familiar with both mdma and ketamine therapy because ketamine therapy is really interesting because yeah. now that's fully legal yeah, right yeah, yeah. the ketamine spray yeah. well ketamine allows you to disassociate from the negative aspects of those former experiences that were traumatic mm -hmm. It's a dissociative. It allows you to remove yourself from the emotional pain of that so you can look at it. But it doesn't particularly inculcate any positive mm -hmm. feelings of safety and love, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But it just gives you space from the negative. So they say, yeah, it's about half as effective okay. when using this. Because it allows you space from the pain to revisit it, to be in the present, and look at it without bringing out the negative. But it doesn't add the positive. MDMA adds the positive in there so it's even more effective. well i mean it's been described as the best tool for psychotherapy ever <laughs> yeah you know i i remember i watched recently that tim ferris recommended this documentary trip of compassion about these uh israelis who had horrible ptsd it's an israeli documentary mm -hmm. they, they document their actual mdma sessions so you get to witness like on camera the catharsis so cool. the catharsis and the healing happening um David Pierce, I don't know if you know him, he's a futurist. He wrote The Hedonistic Imperative. Um, so he writes about basically creating a new generation of designer drugs that have all the benefits of MDMA without any of the sort of neurotoxicity issues that happens maybe if you overuse it. Um, although a lot of that has been debunked, but still you can't do MDMA every day. No, but, but, sure he, but he says that it's a glimpse of the perfect human state. Mm -hmm. Like he says, oh, this is like a vision of what could be for human beings, yeah. the way the world looks through the lenses of MDMA. And Sam Harris said something very similar um, in an interview where he was talking about how his interest in, in meditation began with an MDMA session that he did with his best friend. And he saw, he described it as an experience for the first time of his the true essence or his true self. Mm -hmm. And that as the medicine started to wear off, he felt the layers of neurosis start mm -hmm. to encumber his <laughs> true self again. Yeah. And it was this capacity to witness the other person without any self-concern. Because most of the time you don't experience other people except through the prism of expectation, worry, social standing, what are they thinking of me? How should I act right now? You know, like all this constant mirroring that that's just the side effect of being a social animal and being in a Darwinian environment, but that MDMA allows us to experience others without the those layers of neurosis and the, the, those algorithmic Darwinian codes and just experience the other in, in a pure way. And he calls that love. So it, it's kind of, kind of amazing you know, it's I, fucking incredible and and so i've been around the only spiritual master that i've had a direct experience with yeah. is don miguel ruiz and i got to spend a week with him in mexico Jeez. and it's similar to the reports that i hear from people who spent with ram das and people who spent with some of the the real masters of yeah. our time and then there's been a lot of masters and mystics who people have report this thing yeah. but the transformation is not necessarily from the words like yeah, Don Miguel, he talked to us about some stuff and he gave, told some cool stories, but really the medicine of that was how present he was for every single fucking hug, mm. every single hello, 
every time I watched him look at the sunset, every single moment that I was around him was like, holy shit. Like he is really here mm. and really present and really engaged in the awe of life, even though this sunset's been the yeah. same for the last six days. The glass of wine, which is mediocre that he's drinking, has been the same for the last six days. Yeah. But when he sips it, yeah. it's like he's drinking the that's nectar right. of life that's itself. Right. Like, right. and that's a recalibrating experience. Same with the people who I've, you know, talked to who've been around Ramdas. Like, I don't know. He it wasn't what he said, but it was just something to be around them. And then me, when I've been in these sessions with somebody on MDMA and they reach that level, it's like being around Don Miguel for oh, yeah. a little while. It's like, holy shit, you are the master here. Like, doesn't matter where what their knowledge was or what they're saying. It's like, I'm learning from you. I'm learning what's possible for the human heart. Oh, yeah, full on. I, I would say that that is, um, I mean, for me, that feels like something to aspire to. You know, when you become a, black belt in the art of trumping hedonic adaptation yeah. um i'm not there yet but i build my whole life around taking myself to that place even yeah. if it's just temporarily so the reality of hedonic adaptation is one of the biggest existential bummers of all hedonic adaptation basically means that our experience of consciousness is mediated by neurochemistry and neurochemistry responds to contextual cues, right? So novelty makes you feel more alive because you're seeing something for the first time. Your brain is more engaged, your dopamine fires. It's really exciting. But you eat that same fucking ice cream for six days in a row and then it starts to taste like shit. It's yeah. just hedonic adaptation. The amount of pleasure you get from the same stimuli gets less and less and less and less over time. Now I'm sure that can be thwarted maybe with years and years and years and years of meditation and practice so that you can just be in the MD DMA like state all the time. But for people who are still learning, like me, I have had to pay attention to how hedonic adaptation works and then to try to, within reason, curate my life to basically overcome that or to avoid hedonic adaptation. One way I do that is to always chase novelty, always expose myself to beautiful art. It there's a it's it's a bit externally focused rather than internally focused and this is something my girlfriend criticizes because she's like well you you can't build your whole life around chasing elating experiences and i'm like maybe i can but that's that's my whole thing and when i do get to those states um that's when i make my work that's when i do my videos yeah and when i was reading michael pollan's book i i, I have you i don't know if you've interviewed you interviewed have, him. yeah, yeah. I, I, I've been in touch with him. I kind of love him because I, I sense in him. I sense in him a kindred spirit, mm -hmm. not just in his in his in his eloquence and appreciation of altered states, but also in his in his neurosis. And 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 the reason is in in the prologue, in the opening of how to change your mind, he describes the default setting of the of the of the human mind, and he says the brain is like an artificial intelligence program that takes in data from the present compares it with data from the past, and then uses that to make inferences about the future. The brain is essentially a prediction machine. And there's an evolutionary reason for that, right? We had to plan again, plan, plan ahead and mitigate against threats, you know, sure. when we were in the savannas of Africa. So the default of our brain became a future tense, low level hum of anxiety. And he has a funny line. He says, the good news is I'm seldom surprised. <laughs> the bad news is, I'm seldom surprised, Yeah. right? The been there's and seen that's of the adult mind. And when you become successful in the world and a master of the world, it means you've mastered all threats, but it also means you're fucking jaded and bored, right? Because you've dominated the world to mitigate against threats, but then you're bored and unengaged, you know? And so, so then what he says is, so you're either in a low level hum of anxiety or you're bored and disengaged one or the other, right? Chick Send Me High's book talks about flow, that one state beyond boredom and anxiety. Mm -hmm. We're normally oscillating between those two. So what Michael Pollan says is that certain kinds of experiences, or one of the things that commends travel, art, and certain kinds of drugs, and I would put cannabis in this category, is that these experiences block all signals forwards and backwards. They block our capacity for foreboding and planning ahead, and they block our constant comparing of this with the past. And so by blocking all signals forwards and backwards, you're hurled into the flow, right, of the present that is literally wonderful, wonder-full, wonderful. Mm. Wonder, which is one of the best states of consciousness that exists, a state of wonder, wonder being the byproduct of that unencumbered sense of first sight to which, or that virginal noticing, a child's eye view 
to which the adult brain has closed itself. And those were his words, but I was like, that's exactly why I like to get high <laughs> in new places because I'm somebody that struggles with being present. Totally. I'm an, oh, I'm an effective too. operator in the world. I'm never late. You know, I was 30 <laughs> seconds late to this podcast. I was freaking out, but I'm always thinking ahead. I fucking yeah. plan amazingly and my life is in fucking order, okay? But I fucking struggle with being present. Sure. So I need to put myself in a radically new environment and then I need to get high on cannabis in order to block all signals forwards and backwards and be finally in the flow of the present. In fact, I would argue that the short-term memory disruption component of cannabis is precisely what evokes that air of profundity with every waking moment. And this is also what Michael Pollan has written because we get flooded by sense impressions, but then we're drained of those sense impressions just as quickly because of the short-term memory disruption. Mm -hmm. So you're actually in the moment living note to note, yeah. right? Because your brain can't like even compare this to five minutes ago or imagine what's around the bend. And so that is a delicious space to be. And now that pot is legal, I actually think that we could really like design encounters with the present moment by combining certain external environments with cannabis and hurling people into the astounding frontier of the present. And the best, you know, one of the best things about being really high and it yeah. could be cannabis or psilocybin, yeah. psilocybin can have that effect too. And okay. obviously, yeah. um, but you can be doing something and you can look at the time and be like, Oh my God, only 22 minutes have passed? That's right. This is fucking incredible. That's right. That's I feel like this has been hours because you're so present. That's right. You know, like it, this projection into the past and the future, it robs us of 100%. The, the eternity that is now, right? 100%. So you'll go through like an hour and you'll be like, it feels like it's been days yeah. I've been here. Yeah. And that's what being present really feels like. And, and that gets rid of anxiety of because course. all anxiety is rooted in the fear of death and in the fear of ephemerality and in the fear that everything is passing and in the fear that every day is a day we'll never get back. But that's the brain in a, living in a in prison of its own making because the brain is living in this abstraction of hyper-awareness that everything is finite. But all these moments, all these finite moments are actually glimpses of eternity if you're in them. But we don't, we spend very little time in them. We're like up here watching ourselves mm. and we're like, oh, this is, this is gonna be over in an hour. I, 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 like, and then, okay, <laughs> contrast that with other drugs. Contrast yeah. that with a night where you're drinking and blowing cocaine or something like yeah. that, right? Yeah. No that way. time goes like that. <laughs> That time flies by, oh shit, it's 5 a.m. already. Because you don't even, you're not there. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it's fun or whatever in the moment, wh whatever's going on in your brain and that, you know, excess GABA and all the other dopamine that the coke or whatever the stimulant is having. Cocaine, I think, is a fucking, it's, I like a lot of drugs. It's not a drug that I like, but there's, yeah. even alcohol itself, it's the nights pass by and yeah. you don't get it. But if you're really high or if you have the right dose of psilocybin and you're in the mountains or something like that, it's like it, it just stretches that out. And oh I can look back at some of the most enjoyable moments of my life and it's when time expanded. Oh, 100%. One of the, so radically. And, 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 I'm, I'm, and I'm very like, I'm obsessed with like understanding or deconstructing those experiences because I'm interested in repeatability and reproducibility. Mm -hmm. Again, because I'm not yet enlightened, that's not my default state. <laughs> I need to get good, really good at constructing those states. One of the metaphors I use when you're really present, um, life's a ride right? Um, but most of the time you're on this roller coaster, but you can kind of see the rail that's ahead of you. So no curve is really ever surprising, or usually the surprises are negative, right? People have yeah. their lives in order. They know the rail in front of them. And then if a fucked up thing happens and hits them sideways, that that's no bueno. But in these safe containers, you know, and when you are allowing yourself to be fully present, it's like being in the front of a roller coaster and the rails in front of you are being constructed as you arrive to them, <laughs> kind of in a, like in a video yeah, game. Yeah, man, yeah. And, that, and that's not a, you don't wanna be like that in the default world because no. you'll get run over by a car. Right, like you, <laughs> right. You, you don't, but if you can construct environments that are built for that version of consciousness, for one in which there's a, a beautiful disorientation and a lack of foreseeing the next instant, then every second moment, right, is a surprise. Like I went on safari in South Africa last year, for example, and we had the, the vape pens, the mm -hmm. cannabis vape pens, and I was with my best friend. We understand each other very well. And so here we were, three in the afternoon, they're about to take us on that safari car with, you know, it has no ceiling, whatever. Yeah. There's a guide and there's a tracker. And as soon as those, those trucks, those cars leave the camp, 
you leave even the main road because as soon as they see like lion shit, the tracker's like, the lions must be this way. We're off the reservation. So you don't even have a road in front of you that, tell, <laughs> that tells your mind where you're heading. So yeah. you're like in the bush and then you get like baked as hell. <laughs> so you're like in the astounding frontier of the present in this moving vehicle and the world is coming at you in real time. It is the most engaged than I've ever been in my life, dude. Yeah. And I remember feeling, I was like, oh, this must be an approximation of those like states of sacred reverie that these poets talk about. This is Blake's world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower, infinity mm -hmm. in the palms of our hands and eternity in an hour. I mean, it's like, and granted, it, it, it's not cheap to construct an experience like that, but like, yeah, I mean, if I if I could just literally treat my entire, f my, all my free time into phenomenological, aesthetic, experimental spaces, you know, Eric Davis, you know, Eric Davis, and well. sorry, sorry to get super heady, but he wrote Technosis, but he basically talks about the experience economy and the rise of the experience economy and how our, I, and, and Jamie Wheel talks about this too, the advances in psychology, technology, neurobiology, and pharmacology that are happening right now, the four forces of ecstasy, are giving us an understanding of the lived experience, the matrix of lived experience of subjectivity, and are allowing us, therefore, to create an economy that directly engages the technical material of the self to warp and steward awareness for a price. It's Disneyland for tripping adults. It's Burning Man, yeah. actually, is yeah. what it is. So if somebody is attempting to describe the lived experience of being at Burning Man on your electric bike with omnidirectional freedom and hyper novelty everywhere you look, that is an approximation of the kind of, kind of bliss fuck state that we're talking about. And that's what I felt in South Africa. And so granted, I don't live in that space all the time, I'm not enlightened, but I've built my life around giving myself access to that at least once every couple of weeks. So, and that's, and, that, and then that fuels and that's my fucking, work. That's fucking essential, right? Like that's, that's the step one that we can all attain. And if I actually, if I was actually being fully honest and I'm talking about, all right, what are your best life experiences, mm -hmm. Ob? Mm -hmm. Well, I think three of them would be skiing on about a gram of psilocybin. And I would just go down a back bowl that right. I've never gone before right. and riding the chairlift right. and right. seeing the mountain right. like I was seeing it for That's the right. first time and feeling my muscles and my body and exploring new terrain and seeing the little sprigs of pine coming That's up right. and dodging. I'm not doing fucking crazy terrain no. and jumps no. and shit. No. I'm just fucking shredding through powder and laughing with my friends and we get down That's to the right. bottom and we're just howling That's and we're right. listening to Tribe Called Red and it's like That's that right. was just an experience that is really one of the top life experiences 100%. that I've had. And so, all right, definitely go cultivate those. But then you start looking at some of the master's work. And how do they sustain this? Well, they start, what, what you really, they say like in Polishing the Mirror, Ram Dass's book, he says, if someone asks me if I'm happy, I say yes. If someone asks me if I'm sad, I say yes. If someone asks me if I'm depressed, I say yes. If someone asks me if I'm anxious, I say yes. It says, I am all the things and all of these things have equivalent value and appreciation to me, mm. right? So it's not having the judgment and hierarchy of this is good, this is bad, mm. and I need, need to avoid this and I need to move towards this and mm. that, because that engages the thinking brain. But in the present of all experiences of all of these things, it's like that is the access to the divine is access to everything and not tilting yourself one way and tilting yourself the other and that's some fucking trippy shit that's mm. how, i mean i'm not even anywhere close to that because i have such strong preference i have preference for the things that feel good mm -hmm. not preference for the things that are hard mm -hmm. and so i do the hard Same. things for the thing that might be good later and i'll orient that but I think the path to mastery is appreciating all the things, amor fati, love your fate, love what is, love whatever that thing is that you're experiencing now, be present for it, even if it sucks. Can you do that while still having projects in the world that you have to work diligently to realize? And, 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 and so the reason I ask is I'm a big fan of, of cinema, right? I, mm -hmm. I, just, I just think movies are most wonderful and sublime in, incarnation of the human capacity for divinity. 
And when I think of what a director, or like a writer director has done there, right? He's, he's like, it's like, he's like, he's built a cathedral, but he's like, Tarkovsky used to say cinema is sculpting in time, mm-hmm. you know, like he's to write a script, to cast the characters, to film all the scenes and sequences, and then to go into the editing room, arrange them in a particular sequence or patterns of images and then add music to it. I mean, it's like the the capacity of cinema to well, steward the mind of the viewer towards like realms beyond is incredible. But I imagine that the filmmaker was not necessarily in a state of Zen and acceptance during the process of making the film. He was like a fucking mad scientist, not sleeping, in despair, fighting to realize his vision, suffering for years until finally like he created this thing. You know, like, I, I just, I imagine that filmmakers are beautifully tormented people and that, that the only peace they, they ever find is when they're in the editing room adding music to their scenes. Like Cameron Crowe once said, making a movie is just an excuse to go into the editing room and add music to the movie <laughs> later. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just, yeah, I just, well, that I, I guess be, what, I, what I fear is that if I, if I find too much calmness, too much like stoic acceptance, that I will become passive in the world. So you look at the, the so the counterpoint to that would be the, the Buddhists who create those beautiful sand mandalas. Mm-hmm. They'll spend weeks, mm-hmm. weeks and weeks putting grain of sand on grain of sand to approximate the sacred geometry of that influx of the chrysanthemum you see on DMD. And it's grain of sand by grain of sand present in that moment, in the bliss of it. And they just look at it for a few moments yeah. before wiping it away. And, and like I think we have that potential possibility to engage fully but not be attached to the permanence of any of that. And I think that's kind of one of the hidden and and kind of uh, almost trivialized parts of Burning Man. Yeah, you burn things. And it's a little subtle reminder of that, that that we don't get to keep this. But we don't get to keep anything. And I think, so I, I do think there is a possible way that you can engage fully and create the art fully yeah. and then just have a big laugh yeah, sure. when it all gets kind of wiped sure. away. And I, and, I, and I realize in that moment that I'm not, that I'm not there yet. When I hear a beautiful piece of music, the, the urge to record, to transcribe, to bottle that experience is so powerful that sometimes I'll pause out of the experience to take out the camera and record it. You know, like I, when Shazam was invented on cell phones and you could be hearing a song and point <laughs> your phone at it and then download it from the universe into your phone and have it archived forever. I was like, the fucking singularity is near, you know, because it yeah. was just like transitory, ephemeral unfoldings could be instantly bottled into your like catalog of ecstatic moments. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and that desire to, to keep these things because they're so special. That's like right. how do you release that desire to hold and to collect and to cover? I don't know if I, I have, ever, I don't know if I ever will. But the thing is at the same time, a lot of the times those things that I want that I archive, once I know that they're archived in the drawer, I barely even look at them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I go back to like exactly. the next thing. Yeah. But I just, in the back of my mind, I take comfort in knowing you know, I have a big box with a lock on it that has all my old photos. And eh, fucking maybe once a year I'll go in there. But just knowing that it's preserved it makes me sleep better at night, you know? I understand. I was, so I was sitting I was sitting in my living room and I have a really good friend and her name's Ellie Duhay and she's an amazing musician. Mm-hmm. And she plays the guitar, she plays the piano. Yeah. And she can, what she says, channel music where basically she gets out of the way and she just plays. She yeah. finds chords and yeah. plays and sings. And she sang a song on the piano. And I was recording some of her songs that she knew. And she, she was kind of playing them acoustically. And mm-hmm. it was beautiful. I was already weeping. And then she's kind of fucking around on the piano. And we're just listening. And she's finding some certain things. And then she locks in. And no cameras are going. She locks in and starts singing a song to me. And it was one of the most beautiful songs. I mean, I didn't know it was about me. But I could, I could sense some things like, oh, fuck. And it was one of the most beautiful experiences I've ever had with any music ever. Mm. And, and I go, did you, and I finish that and I'm weeping and I go, did you r- write that song while you were here? We were hanging for a couple, did you write that song while you were here? She's like, no, it just came through me. And I was like, did anybody record that? It was like, no. I was like, oh no, oh no, God, no. And then I was like, could, could you duplicate that? And she was like, ah, I can try. Mm. And she tried, she spent the next day trying. And she's like, I think I got a little bit close, but mm. it's not the same. That mm. thing 
is gone, yeah. but I'll have the memory of that. Yeah. But it is, but it is weird. It's like, God, what I, what would I give for that song? But well, maybe if I did have it on my phone, I'd probably listen to it once or twice, may, maybe more. But the experience of being there in that moment was really was really enough. But it's hard to wrap your mind around. Yeah, that. yeah. I th I think that a a big part of how I connect and experience that communion with people I care about is through shared experiences. And often I have experiences that I share that happen, right? That I participate in or curate that unfold in front of me. And I might be sharing it with this friend, but then I get this ache or this knot in my stomach of like, oh, this other friend needs to experience this. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Or I need to, my girlfriend needs to be here for this. Oh, I need to, I, I listen to this. I'm like, oh my God, I need to like sh play this for my friend. Because in, in many ways, like I think that our consciousness is distributed in between the minds of the people we're most close to. Mm -hmm. Like we exist because they do. And the people that we're closest to, like I think they're part of our mind, you know, in some metaphysical way. And so often an experience isn't real unless I can vet it and it can be acknowledged by one of the people that I'm close to and yeah. that they can, they can both, I can see in their and at eyes least we they're can, experiencing yeah, it like yeah, yeah, I yeah, am. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and so much of my life, like when I was in high school, when I first started like making videos and getting stoned, I mean, why do I make videos, bro? I'm yeah. making videos because if, if a moment, something is coming through and then I want to record that and I want to try to like edit it and put music and start convey like what that moment was like. And then like bring it to my friend, turn the lights off and be like, bro, smoke this joint. <laughs> Just sit here, sit here and let me play this for you, you know? And like give them an experience that will play them like an instrument, you know? And so I just, I, I, without that, I wouldn't be me. That's like all I've ever done mm. is to find ways of like bottling and then sharing these very private moments. And, and, and so in some ways the letting go of that you know, feels like like a letting go of me. You would have you would have to grieve that. Yeah. You would really have to grieve that, and the letting go would be hard. And and I think that is hard. And and I think I mean but, we're recording this conversation. We're recording, yeah, yeah. But you know, it's like going scuba dive. Have you ever gone scuba diving? I've gone snorkeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I love it. <laughs> it's amazing. But they always say like, never go scuba diving by yourself because when yeah. you see something that's yeah. so magical right. underwater yeah. that you can't possibly describe. Yeah, you can bring cameras and stuff, but it's never going to be the same as actually being underwater that's and right. seeing that thing. But at least if you have that one buddy that you can come back up into the boat to and go like, "Yo, do you fucking see, see that?" Right. But that's you know? pretty much the most joyful moments of my life, dude. <laughs> yeah. Like I pretty much, like, as far as I'm concerned, like the meaning of life is to go have like astounding and magnificent shared experiences with people and then talk about them. Mm -hmm. And and then the, the icing on the cake is then hopefully recording the reflection and having that, sharing that with others. And if that can uplift somebody's day, then it helps me get over the guilt of how self-indulgent my day was. <laughs> You know, but I feel like, well, hey, man, if if I take in the world and then I respond to what I take in in the form of my art, then I owe it to myself to spend most of my resources in crafting experiences that allow me to grow and experience rapture and awe. There's that line by F. Scott Fitzgerald where he talks about um, the, the 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 feeling of, of of wonderment, and he says he talks about Dutch sailors seeing the new world for the first time. And he talks about, uh, the quote is, for a transitory enchanted moment, man must have held his breath, compelled into an aesthetic contemplation he neither understood nor desired, face to face for the last time in history with something commensurate to his capacity for wonder. You know, I, I, I mean, that gives me a hard on, but like, <laughs> because I know that feeling so well. Yeah. It's, it's you scuba diving and then seeing the, the blue whale and just having a moment that's so radically alien and that violates your expectations, those algorithms of prediction that your brain is always running so much. It smacks your face into the now, and you are in that transitory enchanted moment, finally can measure it to your capacity for wonder. Like absolute awe, cracked open by like aesthetic arrest, as Joseph Campbell would say. And like, that's everything to me. Mm. Like that's fucking everything. And then it'll get me for the next couple of weeks because I have so many <laughs> yeah. videos reflecting yeah, on that. Yeah. I'll read so many articles. I'll download so many things. I'll, I, it'll send me down a thousand and one rabbit holes to try to make sense of that experience. That's my integration until I'm ready to go have it again.
but the and then one of the beautiful lessons of the psychedelic experience though is like if I've, i have a beautiful little backyard yeah and if i'm on a good psychedelic in my backyard i will go see the same tree yeah, yeah, that yeah. i've looked at a million fucking times and i'll see sure. that the way the bark has entwined around it and the leaves and the negative space in the leaves and then the flowers that are blooming and this thing that i've become so tolerant of that i've become so used to all of a sudden becomes novel again and becomes magical the the fuzz on the leaves of the succulents and i'll be like wow wow you know and that moment of wow yeah. is available not only in this in the wild external it actually is available to us all around oh, us yeah. Yeah. you know the the, the i wish i could learn that being. fucking lesson right like that, i feel that, like right, the, the, right. why do i seem to always forget mm -hmm. and 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 it's so true I, i i i even notice it sometimes in photos um when i see a photo from like a trip or an experience and i can see that the photo was taken after a bliss fuck crucifixion <laughs> you know um i think it was um rod robert moore in archetypes of initiation he said if you cannot submit you cannot die if you cannot die you cannot be reborn and and again i, I The, the actual prospect of physical death like still haunts my dreams but psychological death is something that i can still see its value and what that means is an experience in which you completely lose yourself mm -hmm. you know and and then the realization that you persist that 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 in the submission in the moment in the roller coaster where it goes clack 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 climbing up and you have that pit in your stomach but then the release of being thrown over the freaking the summit and then you're just like now you have no choice When you're on the other side of that, bro, the, you're right. The, the the expression on your face, the the grace, yeah. the the acceptance, the peacefulness. That, that's the best feeling in the world, right? The, the 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 rebirth, the halo on the other side of any kind of death practice, whether it's a creative experience in which you lost yourself, and before you know it, like six amazing videos came through, you know, mm -hmm. or you went snorkeling and you saw the blue <laughs> whale. For three, you were there for three hours. You know, it's when you're coming back on the boat and it's sunset, and you're like on the other side of that experience. That's like one of my favorite moments. And then I'm like, oh my god, I'm enlightened. Now. <laughs> and then like I wake yeah. up the next morning and I'm just as restless. You know, yeah. And that's then, the problem. And then the the we forget. And then the ropes that bind our heart and the, all those old anxieties and all of those things start to come and settle back in. And that's one of the hard parts of integration. Is like, why can't I keep this? Why can't I be there. I felt it. I've tasted it. I've wow. fucking drunk it in so deeply that every cell felt it. And I know it's real. And I still can't will myself there. But I can get a little bit closer, I feel like. And that's, I think, one of the things that yeah. keeps me I mean, like, look, I mean, we're me here. going. I mean, we're, we're close enough that look at our lives, right? I yeah. mean, we, we, we have taken this path that has gotten us to this moment <laughs> that we're sharing this with a pretty substantial audience which i think in some way shows that there has been some some consistency with which we've showed up to ask the same question again and again and again you know whether we've learned the lesson maybe maybe we've glimpsed it glimpsed but here it. we are i mean here we here we fucking are right mm -hmm. and we don't doubt it right. you know we don't doubt it like if if anybody ever asked me and you yeah is that life thing worth it like neither one of neither one of us would ever say ah, i don't know Yeah. We'd say fuck yeah. yeah, it was worth it because oh, I felt it. I felt so many moments where it was so fucking worth it that I'd take all the other bullshit anyways. Oh, yeah. a thousand percent. I would, It's I fucking no, no worth regrets. it. I'll take this ride. And 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 this just occurred to me. Do you think that we have um, a loyalty to our suffering, and that's why we we tend to regress after these experiences in some ways? And a loyalty to my suffering would be even something as simple as if I had a okay. So so. I love my parents, right? I love my mom and dad. I'm very close to them. When I spend a lot of time with them and I say goodbye, I get kind of sad and I miss them. Um, and then maybe a few days later, I'm with a friend in Tulum and we went snorkeling and I had a fucking life-changing moment of like just poetry and bliss and awe. And I didn't think of my parents for all day, for the last three days. And then all of a sudden I think of my parents and there's this guilt. I'm like, oh. I should be missing them. I should mm -hmm. text them because I love them because I do love them, mm -hmm. but I haven't missed them in these last few days. Does that make me a bad person? Does that make me like, do I not care about the people I love because I've having so much fun the last three days with my friends? You know, there, there is a kind of, it's the psychological equivalent of Christian guilt. I think that's you know, exactly it, man. I think it's almost so good that we feel like maybe we don't deserve this yeah. and maybe we owe some 
penance yeah. of suffering. Yeah. We got to pay something yeah. for what we experience. Yeah. So we pay it through our own suffering yeah. to say like, okay, look, we d- I didn't deserve this. This yeah. wasn't even mine. Yeah. This was here. I witnessed it. I got to pay the price for yeah. this. You know, like, when you go to Burning Man without your girlfriend and then you're having such a good time, you actually don't miss her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that make you a bad, uh, you know, but you were, you were like so sad at when you said goodbye and you yeah. missed her the whole ride to Burning Man. You're like, I miss her so much. But then Burning Man slapped you over the face with so many moments of poetry and grace that you didn't miss anybody that wasn't there because the there there was enough. Mm. So then all our loyalties to people that we carry over time when they're not around, like, you know, I tell my best friend, I'm like, we're best friends, but half the time we don't see each other. <laughs> but I would still like, tell myself that they're my best friend when they're not around. But the thing is, any loyalty to what's not around when we're fully present is absurd. Yeah. And also that desire to bring those people with you. Like I remember one time I was, you know, I left someone, one of a a lover that I cared deeply about at Burning Man. This is the, uh, I think the second, maybe the second, maybe the first Burning Man actually. Mm. And I had some great MDMA and I kind of got separated from my group and I was just doing figure eights on my bike Mm -hmm. somewhere in the playa, not deep playa, Mm -hmm. enough where I could hear the music Mm -hmm. and see the lights. And she'd never, she'd never been. And I was like, God, I wish you were here. Like, I wish you were here on a (laughs) bike right next to me so that you could feel this thing and this longing to just like, Mm. ah, you know, so, and it wavers from that thing. But I think, yeah, transcending the guilt and knowing that that pleasure that bliss it's it's our birthright it's yeah. our it's our shared piece yeah. of divinity that we all have and we don't need to pay a price for that like yeah. we deserve it we all deserve it not because of what we've done not because we've been great not because we've yeah. done anything that made us deserve it. we deserve it because we're alive yeah no no full on full on and yet shared experience is what makes us close to people yeah so if we don't include those people that we have decided are the people that we love because of past shared experiences if we don't include them in future shared experiences there will be a distancing that takes place i think and yeah. that's that's just that's one of the things that i that i that i struggle with you know because there's so many people in my life that i want to include um in all of these moments, you know, I remember even even in like high school talking to my closest friends and being like, we have to remember this. We have to do more of this, <laughs> this feeling, this connection, mm-hmm. this conversation. We can't forget the way everybody else forgets, right? Because everybody else is like, see you later. They miss each other for a while, then it fizzles out, then that's it. Yeah. And I, I never allowed anything significant to fizzle out. Maybe that's the, 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 the level of that neurotic muscle. Yeah. There's a consistency in my character structure that I think just comes from saying like the things that matter you don't forget. Yeah. And I'm loyal to those things still, even when it causes me suffering. Yeah. Well, fuck, man. I'm glad we got to do this. <laughs> I don't even remember what we talked about. <laughs> we started we about to... the madness of love. <laughs> we should do this again because I feel like I was, as I was speaking to you, I found my, it was, it was a little bit difficult for me to stay on point because I was having so many racing thoughts of things I wanted to share with you. Yeah. And then, but oh, then yeah. I wanted to listen to you. <laughs> and then I was like, he's saying something really fascinating, but don't forget what you want to say, Jason. Remember what you need to tell him that thing. To... And then I, I finally surrendered, but I feel like, I feel like, I don't know, I sense a kindred spirit. I think there's no a doubt, lot more really. to share. No man. doubt. Every, every time we've hung out, we, yeah. we sense that. It's just taken us, oh, five years, yeah. I don't know, yeah, to, totally. to actually get here and, uh, and do this. So. Thank you for what you do in the world, man. I, Likewise, I feel, brother. Thank I feel, you. I feel your heart. Thank you, man. Likewise. Yeah, I feel it. Like I feel, I feel your heart. I feel your love. I feel the way you show up, and I feel your suffering. But I feel like you suffer because you love. Yeah. So it's all good. Yeah. You know, the suffering is the love. Yeah. Ultimately, yeah. Exactly. At the, exactly. At the very base level. Man. Yeah. Yeah. And if you treat it as such, you know, if 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 you don't let the suffering um, ever make you actually resign, you mm-hmm. know, then it's okay. Mm-hmm. Then the suffering is beautiful. Like. Let's cry together, you know? Yeah. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah. let's feel. Yeah, like, let's feel. Like, it's okay. And give ourselves permission. Um, yeah, then, then that's, that's, just, that's, just, that's just being alive, man. That's, that's just, it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So thank you. You're welcome, brother. And thank you. Uh, anything you want to point people to, man? Any oh, yeah, yeah. Cool, Great, cool man. Cool shit? Mm, yes. So um, I got a bunch of new content. Uh, so I point people to my, to my social feeds. I'm at... Jason L. Silva on uh, Facebook and Instagram, at Jason L. Silva. So add me on those. And my Shots of Awe videos on YouTube. Incredible. Um, thanks, man. Um, yeah, I got some some new content in particular that I'm really excited about. Um, 
I love the synchronicity that I experience sometimes with my with my videos. Just to end on this last note, so I shot something uh, recently that I thought was one of the most like honest pieces that that ever has come out of me, and it flowed so smoothly. And I was like, ah, what kind of edit to do this justice? You know, there's so much poetry here, but mm -hmm. I I want to raise the raise the quality of of, of, of the edit of the music of the, the imagery. And, and later that day I was browsing Instagram and I see a random message from a random person in India who's like, it would be my dream to edit something for you. And I have no idea who this person is. And I normally don't have time to answer all the tech, all the comments. Cause you know, you, there's, it's too much. Um, but I don't know why I replied to him and I'm like, Oh cool, man, shoot me an email to my website and, and I'll send you some stuff so you can show me what you got. And he emailed me and this particular video that I was just like, this video is too complex to edit. I just sent it to him. This guy in Kerala, India, who I've never met before. I have no idea who he is. And I sent it to him. I was like, here, take a stab at this. What would you do? He sent me back in 48 hours, probably the greatest video. Hell yeah. Ever. Hell yeah. Ever. I mean, my performance was so smooth. So I, I, never, I never edit myself. If my stream of consciousness is smooth, that's, that's how it's going to show up in the final piece. But I'll have them add sound design, some images. And he just... That what he came back to, you know, talk about us, the universe, like being all of us, you know, like I just like, holy shit, like the universe is bringing in, in invisible beings who communicate via letters on my phone who are helping me realize my art in the world. I mean, it was just so fucking sublime, dude. And What's that one called so we can look for it? Um, it's called This Is Me. And uh, I'm going to post it probably today or tomorrow so Hell yeah. people will see it can't wait to see but, it but but those moments are crazy when that happens you know it's just like it's like oh my god like we have collaborators we haven't even met yet yeah you know, little angels helping us on our way yeah and just being available to listen yeah available that's to right. listen. that's right yeah beautiful man. hell yeah well thank you so much brother and thank you everybody thank you. so much love peace